this is a replica of the, the gong we saw. Yeah. That looks like the head. Oh, so right. That's why I suggested this line to make it. Which one, which one is the one that looks like the head? The one, the other one, the one down the end of yeah, the island. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I've got some challenge here. Yeah. When you look at the other gong, it has some kind of depression here. Right. So moving this chunk off. Yeah, so I mean, shall I just have a little chip at it? Yeah, yeah, please. I mean, you want to take off material from here? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. To this kind yeah. of chip. Yeah, I mean, as I say, it's just a matter of working over the surface mm. like that. Mm. Just pecking at it. Mm. As long as you're working downwards, you just mm. let the weight of the hammer do the work. Fantastic, it's yeah. going to be a nice piece. And that's going to go underneath there? Yeah, yeah, sure. Mm. Just actually, it has to fit in like this. Mm. Oh, it's easier to move the weight, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, like great. That. You know, I was inspired by the gong. Fantastic. And the head. Yeah. So I had to bring in my subject matter. Lovely. Which is this. It's a really nice piece. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. You've done an awful lot of work while you've been here. It's nice to contrast the materials, isn't it? It's lovely. Thank you. Meanwhile, the British musicians find a quiet moment to return to the gongs to analyse individual rock pitches. But it's almost as if you can hear a fundamental in it yeah, as well. Yeah, there's a wagon always here. Be, and also between the F-sharp and E, there's almost a hint of an F, isn't there? The rock itself, because it's a very dense material, it vibrates in all sorts of interesting and unusual ways. And uh, we think it's the crystalline structure and the rock is actually the thing that's vibrating. The rock as a whole isn't, isn't sort of moving itself like a, a normal percussion instrument or cymbal. And uh, because it's very, very dense, it gives off all sorts of interesting harmonics, all sorts of combinations of sound. And as you move your beta around the rock face, they change. The piano sounds like it does because of the overtones and the oboe sounds like it does because of the overtones. You, you're never actually hearing one note. But what's interesting is the particular notes yeah. and how strongly you hear them. Da, da, dee, ba, ba. All those kinds of sounds you'd expect to get. We've got those, but we've got some really beautiful dissonances as well. And if you start hitting it over and over again, you can hear them begin to resonate mm. and resonate. And there's four or five sounds in that that we can sing mm. and that we mm -hmm. hear them resonate. Mm. I'd like to take them back to Electroacoustic Studio and I would like to take them through a process of revealing more clearly these inner structures without altering them. We won't corrupt the sound, then we'll have a series of really, I think, iridescent musical objects that we can compose with. There are some what seem to be pupae cases in here, Nigel, but they're clearly covered in manuscript paper. The patterning on them uh, is crotchets, quavers, um, sets of lines, and I can see a pair of quavers here that have staccato dots. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the ode to joy. Maybe how, as human beings, when we're inventing signs, we reinvent the things that we've noticed from nature and patterns that are there already. Nature invented crotches and quavers and manuscript paper. I heard this noise. That's amazing. I thought, that sounds like, you know, several million flies. <laughs> and I thought, well, that can't be. I'm just imagining it. <laughs> so I went back to sleep. Um, uh, but it was several million flies. That deep. The zip doesn't pull quite to the end on the tent. And uh, they can all come in through that. <laughs> but we'll learn our lesson we'll learn now. Trial by flies. Do you, think, do you think fly mass suicide is insecticide? <laughs> The idea of taking people away from the safe, controlled environments of workshops or recording studios to make art in a natural, acoustic and wild setting is a challenge that often brings out the best in creative people because it imposes new limitations, helping them feel close to history, close to the elements and close to the dangers of the wilderness. Actually, this isn't an Eden at all. If you were to live here really and uh, to, to know the wilds well, well, there are, there are puff adders around and we've seen one. Plenty of, of animals that will take a bite out of you and deep down it's a wild and uh, ferocious island and much of it hasn't changed for many thousands of years, I think. 
Yeah, really wonderful. I'm not at all surprised that this is um, a special and probably a sacred, ancient sacred site. It's such an extraordinary, spatially, it's absolutely incredible, this enormous rock just resting on these few smaller rocks around the edge. And apparently hasn't been looked at properly by anybody except amateur archaeologists in the 60s. If this was in Europe, there'd be thousands of people coming to look at this. It's absolutely astonishing. White yeah, and then the red. That's right, I hadn't noticed that. You know, they're not incised in any way. And these clearly are very, very ancient. I mean, how they've lasted quite this long, I mean, what the medium is that the oak is with, I've no idea, but it's got to be something pretty... Fat. Yeah, some sort of animal fat. And these, you know, this is... I mean, there's a several of these. What's yes. interesting is they don't, you know, they're sort of not joined up at this point, so you've got this kind of maze-like thing. There are a lot of paintings here as well. I mean, you can see them very clearly on the left, which is amazing because actually this is exposed to the weather. Um, and it's astonishing how sharp they are after so long. Obviously, a lot of it's been obscured by this recent um, writing, which one hopes is in uh, uh, water-based paint. I mean, I dare say, a, you know, a, a restorer could probably do something about it, but... Um, I mean, it's an incredibly beautiful place. I mean, extraordinary, extraordinary landscape. Differences between the African and British musicians have so far been great. How easy will it be to create a new form of music that combines their musical styles and can later be played by the London Symphony at Orchestra? Will one style be more influential than another? And will their different instruments tune together? Now what we are on is to see how these instruments fit in the sounds that come out of the rock. From this end to the other, there are several tones within a simple stone. So we are picking which one fits see, the strings properly so that they have to come, the melodies and the notes may come out properly. The presence of the artists is a big sensation on the island. As a recently settled community, the local people have few cultural traditions themselves and have not had foreign visitors since missionaries in the early 80s. The activities of both sculptors and musicians have become increasingly irresistible. I've had a lot of, lot of comments from all sorts of people, a lot of comments from the local people as well. I mean, people talked about whether it was to do with, um, somehow to do with the fact we're on the equator here, this pattern related to that, perhaps. Um, somebody else said it uh, made them think about the eclipse of the sun. But uh, people have been absolutely delightful. Most people have never seen stone carving before, even though it's a very, um, very slight bit of stone carving. It's just a, a series of incised lines into the surface of the rock. People have been quite interested and intrigued because I think they don't have a tradition very much of making things here at all, and certainly not making things in stone. I think the only thing they do with the stone is to break it up to make fishing weights. Um, so there has been a, a very nice and very warm and positive response from, from local people, which has been lovely. Oh, it's brilliant, isn't it? I haven't been in a, in a tent since I was a child. Admittedly, this is pretty five-star treatment here, isn't it? But it's, it's been most enjoyable. And very beautiful having, having the sculptors with us. It's made me look uh, at the rocks with a new eye. I kind of recognised that they were beautiful. Uh, but it made me realise how beautiful they are. From my point of view, it was really uh, 
a response to the actual shape of the, of the stone and the, the ochre that's used on the paintings, the ancient paintings in the, in the caves associated with the gongs and also to some extent determined by what I could actually do uh, physically achieve within six or seven days. Also the sense a little bit of, um, of the idea, you know, the whole project being to do with sound coming from stone, the whole idea of the sort of uh, ripples, these kind of concentric pattern working out from the centre. But what I didn't want is for it to look like a kind of target, so I tried to avoid that by having a little kind of uh, slightly amorphous shape in the centre rather than ending up with a circle in the middle. I wanted to get it so that the morning light would hit across this face and, uh, and actually bring out the relief in the carving because with this sort of low relief carving it makes an enormous difference if you've got oblique light. So we set this part of the sculpture more or less in an east-west axis so that as the sun comes up it would strike across the surface and actually bring out the relief which it does so I'm really pleased with that. It's worked quite well. Dissecting those, those sounds was quite hard. I was amazed at how Nigel could hear so well. Yes, it's making me really go deep inside the oboe. What can I get out of this that's, that's completely unusual? I'm sort of splitting it up like the sounds I'm hearing. It's more than one note. One note is strong, but other are other notes as well. There's five to six notes at the same hit, that's and right. some of them move. But within those, some of the notes just stay the same. So it must go, bam, but the other one might go, Ba, ba, just move. So you must imagine the first sound going on somewhere, <laughs> and then you get something as complicated as this. To be honest, it has given us the people who play the, the, the percussion uh, a very uh, hard time to see, to fit actually in. I think by the end of the session, we'll be ready together with the, the rest of the musicians and we'll bring out something good. This is every little, every note there came from the rock. It was very interesting for us to see how um, African musicians would relate to those sounds uh, in terms of the ones that they preferred and the way they approached and the structures they built from them. Because in a sense, African music has probably retained a closer link for those things than European music has. What we could bring um, was the, the kind of scientific approach to it, and that's why we were meticulously recording all the frequencies we could hear, and also the modernist approach. When a hornbill spontaneously answers the violin, the modernist approach allows the musicians to incorporate its responses into their music as they develop their improvisation up at the gongs. The modernist idea that there is something really beautiful hidden inside sound in the universe, that the things that are in objects as you sound them can give us sensations, logics, patterns that can be very important to extract and make things with, that is confirmed by this. As a composer, I'm a little bit medieval. Medieval composers thought of the world in three spheres. Musica mundana, the music of the spheres and the spirit. Uh, musica instrumentalis, the musical instruments, and musica humana, the music of human beings and humanity. And I feel touched on all three levels in this, very, very much so. Um, the rock gongs touch all of those levels, the strange spiritual resonances. What is the spirit? It's what we don't know that moves us. It's not mumbo drum, but it's what we don't know, can't know and instrumentally speaks for itself. These are extraordinary instruments, and that's influencing me where the sound. 
and human perhaps most of all. That comes from the musicians, Ugandan musicians. And they're fabulous musicians, the Ugandans. We've got on very, very well, I think on a personal level, and we've got on very well musically as well. We've understood what it is each other wants to do, and I think we've got a very nice marriage of what they do and what we do. The rock gongs have been a revelation. I had no idea that they would sound so beautiful, and to go on then and bring some of the music out of the rocks it has just been a, a very special experience. And I would hope in the music that I write from this will carry that deepen of emotion, human communication, beauty, love, brilliance and dark. The rock guns were a meeting point. We were all discovering something together at the same point that was of equal relevance to our histories because this is the cradle of mankind. And it wasn't just the ancestors of the Ugandan musicians that played those gongs. Ours did. So that, that added something, that we could all discover part of our own musical roots. Where did those men go? Those who managed to sit and think and try the stones until they got out their melodies. There are so many stones, but there are very few with their melodies. How did they come to find out that such a stone has a melody? The others don't have. That is what is still puzzling. The outcome was beautiful. The team now have to consider how they transpose the sound of the gongs into the orchestra for future performances. Well, we're going to try and devise a sampler, create a sampler keyboard, whereby um, we can arrange it and label it, the different rock gongs. And there's maybe 40 sounds here. So it needs a three octave keyboard or so. And um, so that people can play and can get the sounds out. They can play melodies together uh, across the different rock gongs. It's the whole island of Lulawe resonating. To these sounds, and then if we do a performance, we can play it as part of the performance. This is shown that within our country, Uganda, but we have no musician has ever come near here. So we are very, very, very proud to have been one among the millions in the world to play the stones where our ancestors played. We have definitely achieved the greatest thing in our lives and we hope if we carry it on we shall bring a unique version of the music to the whole world. <laughs>